All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jamie Waller, who is in London in the UK or across the pond, as they like to say here. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm doing great, John. How are you? Great. And Jamie's a serial entrepreneur, philanthropist and author, founder and past chair of the Princess Trust Enterprise Network and author of Unsexy Business and The Dyslexic Edge, which let me just bring it up here quickly on screen so people can see that. Do you book the the dyslex the dyslex dyslexic edge easy for me to say unleash the power of thinking differently uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today is dyslexia and uh, entrepreneurship so um, so let's uh, let's get straight into uh, let's get straight into it Jamie um, tell me why did you want to bring um, number one like how has your dyslexia how have you managed to harness your dyslexia as a positive thing and then what made you want to parlay that into like a business book and 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 all of this yeah well thanks John. so look I, I was born in a in a very poor part of east london in in bethnal green east london and um you know i like to say i was born with dyslexia adhd colorblind and poor. So I really had to work hard at, at becoming successful. My school career was horrendous. You know, I was uh, just known to be thick or disruptive. And I went from trying really hard at school, having a really close bunch of friends to just mm. struggling like crazy. So I left school early before sitting any formal qualifications. And, you know, there was only one real option for me, which was to get out there and start working for myself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, deep inside, I didn't know about dyslexia at that stage, John. So I didn't know if, you know, I, I was starting to believe that there was something wrong with me. I just wasn't as bright as, as my peers. And that, that was a real struggle, which men you know i constantly went through life trying to hide the fact that i couldn't write and couldn't spell uh, and and you know growing up in london it was in in the uk it was a known thing that doctors for example had really scruffy handwriting so i thought well doctors aren't thick mm -hmm. so i tell you what i'll do i'll make my handwriting so scruffy that people it disguised my spelling for example and i went through life like that and i was fortunate that i had started my first business age 16 I sold my first significant business for $75 million when I was 35. And it was only then, John, that I had the confidence to come out and say to people, you know what, I'm dyslexic. And when I did that, it, it, it was an amazing weight lifted off my shoulders. And mm -hmm. I realized that I'd been living with this burden for so long that it was, it was atrocious that other people we're, we're having to we're having to do the same so why did right. i write the book why well, you know fast forward a few years and i i've now set up started built and sold a numerous amounts of businesses and, and made my mark in the uk and the us in australia at, at being sort of the startup guy and i was really fortunate that a couple of years ago i was spending some time with one of the most famous dyslexics on earth so richard brunson and him right. and i were on a bike what him and I were on a bike ride talking one day and we were talking about the links between dyslexia, ADHD and sleep disorders. When we start, we, when we fumbled upon the topic of why is every book that's written about dyslexia being written about it being a deficit, a disadvantage, mm -hmm. rather than the powers that dyslexic thinking brings. And the statistics talk for themselves, John. 40% of self-made millionaires are, are considered to be dyslexic and 35% of all entrepreneurs. So it was a story that had to be told because we right. need to change the narrative around this. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And for those uh, listening, particularly those here in the States, I mean, you said you grew up in Bethnal Green, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So just for people to know that, I mean, that's a, uh, it's a pretty full on area to have grown up in, I think, at the at the time. And so, yeah, you probably weren't getting a lot of sympathy from from people. Um, but it's it's really interesting then that when you reach that point at, at 35, when you sold your business and, you know, you felt, OK, I'm ready to come out and the weight lifted off your shoulder. I guess that was the moment when you were, allow were allowing yourself to be your true and authentic self. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? I, I, I was listening to a podcast recently where 
the two hosts, one of the hosts, who's a really ultra successful uh, sort of 65 year old professor said to his younger host, uh, have you ever, have you ever tried psychedelic drugs? And the younger host said to him, uh, I don't think I'm at the stage of my career or old enough to answer that honestly. So let's move on. And I felt some real truth in that, you know, with age or, or success comes the ability to, to start to be your, your authentic self. And I guess for me, I was, I was petrified, John, that if, if, if people found out, they wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't sign contracts mm -hmm. with me. They wouldn't do business with me. Yeah. And what was your experience, though, when you did come out? I mean, was the experience like totally different than you expected? Like where people were like, wow, that's interesting. Well, to, to be honest with you, the experience from the, the sort of externalities around me was was no different. But the experience internally where I could now reach out for people and ask for help. So no longer did I have to disguise stuff. No longer did I have to take 10 times the amount of time to do anything. I could mm -hmm. simply say, hey, we've got to put together this presentation. Can someone check it for me? Because you know we don't want to get some spelling errors. Or can somebody do this? Or can you do that? Because my strengths are here. But it meant that I, all of a sudden, I was given this almost supercharge. I was able to do right. more, more quickly. Uh, and I was able to do businesses faster and better and, and really succeed. Uh, a greater pace and and what what do you contribute some of that to is it the fact that uh is it the fact that you're able to you know leverage you know help or you're able to do things fast you're able to cut through a lot of the stuff because a lot of people get bogged down in kind of perfectionism which is at the end of the day is really an avoidance mechanism because if you, you know you can never create something that's perfect so if you just keep working on it you never get it out there right it's a nice safe place to be cool. oh i'm just, just perfecting it i mean do you find um what are some of the advantages that you found like you know from your dyslexia in order in terms of being able to move maybe as you said faster quicker than other people yeah, well, this is where it gets really interesting, John. So when I started to research, so I, got, I came back from Necker Island after spending some time with Richard, and I started to do some research for the book. And I thought, actually, you know what? I want to team up with an academic in this space to make sure that we get the narrative right. You can't, we don't want to just try and change the narrative to something that we've dreamt up. So mm -hmm. I teamed up with um, Dr. Helen Taylor, a remar remarkable professor here in, in the UK. And she had spent a lot of time researching and had some papers published on this whole thesis that actually dyslexia is nothing more than a brand that we've suitably given to people that learn differently because mm -hmm. ultimately there are two groups of people that are born in the world 15 percent of people are born explorers and 85 percent are born exploiters now if you think pre sort of six, 700 years ago before we, we invented this thing called learning in, in the form of the innovation of reading and writing. The, the explorers were celebrated all the time. They were the people that were going out to find new territories, find food and bring it back for the majority of the population to then exploit and make into something. Mm. And it's those explorers that struggle with what we have, have formed the, the learning of today. And we must remember that learning in, in the main was created by the church. It was created by the church to because they were fearful of knowledge drain, that they were going to, people were going to forget the story of the Bible because people were only living 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole concept of reading and writing is something that we've created ourselves. The fact that 15% of the global population don't, don't seem to be able to pick it up as well as the other 85% is nothing more than the system was designed incorrectly in the first place. Right. So it's my hope that at some stage in life, the whole term dyslexia is just wiped from the dictionary altogether because it's meaningless. It simply means nothing. The population is full of two people, explorers and exploiters. And if you think about the traits that go with exploration, well, they are the traits that make great entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and, and more particular to your audience, very good salespeople. They're always going out and searching for new information. They are used to failure. They're used to going out for days on end and not finding anything, but picking themselves up and, and going again. They're used to getting no's and having to overcome obstacles to make sure they push to get the yeses. And those traits are just typical in both entrepreneurship and sales. So it's not difficult to see why those that we now classify as dyslexic thinkers, or I like to classify as explorers, are mm. very good at both entrepreneurship and, and sales. Yeah. Do you think that it, it, it gave you a certain resilience that perhaps, you know, other people may not have in the same in the same at the same level? 
Yeah, abs- ab- absolutely, John. So I think, you know, the reality is if, you, if you're an explorer, you, you must be resilient. You're constantly in search for, for, for something different, for something new. And you have, to be, you have to be quite robust to failing. And actually, it's quite interesting. If you, if you list all of the traits that are typically known as dyslexic thinking, you can match almost every single one of them to an explorer. But the resilience mm. one, without a doubt is more is enhanced through the dis, through what happens to those with dyslexia at younger age you know the the being rejected the having to work harder the getting mm-hmm. used to failing without a doubt uh, that is something that is developed more strongly in a dyslexic thinker than it is a sort of neurotypical person Mm-hmm. And so, as you got into as you got into the research and that with uh, with the academic you were working with, what were some of the other surprising elements that came came out of it? Well, it was really interesting. So we we thought every time we conducted an interview, so we 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 interviewed fourteen different people for the book. So each chapter focuses on the life story of mm-hmm. a successful dyslexic thinker, and they range from the U.S. print billionaire of Kinko Print, Paul Orfana, who's brilliant. You know, set up his business for twenty five thousand U.S. dollars, and and yep. it later sold for four billion. And every time we interviewed one of these people, we thought, ah. We found something. We found a nugget. They're all addicted to exercise. They all have sleep issues or something else. But the reality was we were wrong. There is no clear defined thing throughout them all. The only one thing that we could wholeheartedly put our hand on our heart and say exists amongst every dyslexic thinker is this real sense of injustice. They hate Mm. to see any form of injustice. And if they see a form of injustice, they typically try to deal with it, either through charitable work, either through creating a business, providing a solution. But that is something that runs through all dyslexic thinkers. And we can we would believe we believe that that is something that's certainly developed post birth rather than is born with you as an explorer. Yeah, which which is a which is a fascinating trait if you think about it, as you said, for for entrepreneurs, for salespeople, because at the end of the day, like the really really good uh, salespeople, entrepreneurs, you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to serve your audience, you're trying to you're trying to find a way to to deliver value, which all seems to tie into what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely, John. And, you know, a a few of the stories that I can pull out from the book on that. I mean, Sir Charles Dunstan, who was a mobile phone billionaire from here in the UK, again, set up his business with £5,000, floated it for £1.9 billion. And Charles's whole business thesis was that he was trying to get a mobile phone. And this is when mobile phones were first arriving. And the mobile phone companies were only interested in selling Uh, phone contracts to the big PLC Mm. companies. They wanted 200 handsets, 300 handsets. And he was a small business and he couldn't get one. And he said, this is ridiculous. So all of the people that need mobile phones are the most are those that are driving around in their cars as a one man band. Why can't they get a mobile phone? And he saw that as a real sense of injustice and he went for it. He went, right, I'm going to be the one who solves that. And he set up a, an organization called Carphone Warehouse, which you will certainly be aware of from yeah, your, yeah. your time back in, back in Dublin. And, you know, that was one of the biggest mobile phone successes the, the UK has, has ever seen. But it, it came from that real sense, real sense of injustice. And one of my own um, previous businesses, I'd worked for an organization where I realized that they were terrorizing their customers. And I remember making a decision. I was only 18 years of age and I made a decision. Do I leave because I really don't believe in what they do? Or do I set up in competition with them? and steal their customers from them. And I decided to set up in competition with them and later made tens of millions of pounds from that. But that was for, for a real sense in the pit of my stomach that I had to do something about it. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating, I mean, that's such a fascinating approach because that's such a, it's such a people-centric approach, if you like. And I think that what you're talking about is sadly lacking sometimes now because, I mean, we're a technology company ourselves, but a lot of people use technology to kind of hide behind, to kind of reduce the whole human contact piece. But what you're talking about really here is is the essence of, of I think, what people really crave. 
I agree. I agree. And it's that, it's that human, hu- human approach, right? And one of the things you do, th- you do find in, in the dyslexic thinking community is that, you know, those, those dyslexic thinkers, they get quite used to having to convey their messages and deal with people verbally mm-hmm. and face to face because the written word isn't their strongest form of communication. And again, that's really what makes them great at, you know, selling, telling, storytelling. Dyslexic thinkers are great at storytelling, which again connects great to entrepreneurship and and sales. Yeah, no, and like you said, I mean, storytelling is is one of the the the, the most fundamental pieces. Like we come from, you know, we come from storytelling traditions. Most most people do, going back years and years. I mean, you know, like back in Ireland, there used to be, you know, the guy who'd go from village to village, and one of the most popular people was the storyteller. Um, yeah. And so we're so we're it's in us. Therefore, we relate to it really well. But like you said, unfortunately, a lot of people just fire off emails and that, and they never get into that kind of interaction. Yeah, well, it's become, I mean, you know, it, it has become all a bit too easy to call yourself an entrepreneur these days, I think. Uh, and the realities of, of entrepreneurship are, are a lot a lot more difficult. But I agree with you, you know, I'm a natural salesperson myself, and I think most entrepreneurs typically are. But, you know, there is nothing stronger than when I've set up my businesses than as the CEO and founder, and especially today, because I'm relatively well known in the UK as a successful mm-hmm. entrepreneur. If I put a headset on for the day and pick up the phone and dial the and you know and call 30 people cold the the amount of value i can create is unbelievable uh you know and it's typically just not done that much today because people are are very quick to hide behind uh, mm. an email or a linkedin campaign yeah and I, and i think one of the, one of the fascinating things that i think is that if you want to differentiate yourself today is you do exactly that is you is you reach out to people you talk to people you treat people like humans you're polite yeah, yeah. you don't make assumptions you know you don't fire off these emails these folksy emails of people like hey how you doing you know to somebody you've never even spoken to before you know so i think uh, i think what you're talking about is fantastic and to be honest if it it gives it gives an advantage to those people who do it because i i think the bar is set so low today it really is i mean where are the days when you used to put a lot of legwork in i remember mm-hmm. what, one of my first early businesses i really wanted to gain this contract i knew i knew the person who controlled the contract i knew where he worked and i could never get to him and i i spoke to a few people and said you know does anyone, where, do they go out after work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And somebody said to me, the pub next door, or it's just opposite the house, there's a parliament here in the UK. They said, in that pub every Friday, you will find John. He's there from about 4 p.m. with a bunch of his team having some beers. So I went there on the Friday at about 3.30, hoping that I could do, oh, John, fancy bumping into you here. Mm-hmm. No John. I went <laughs> back the next Friday, no John. And I thought... God, is somebody winding me up here? And the third Friday come and I bump into John and I'm like, hey, John, fancy bumping into you here. Can I get you a drink? He said, no, because he worked for a big public authority. He said, I can't take a drink off you, but I'll buy you a drink. We stayed drinking until 11 p.m. Now we had a friendship. Yeah. About 14 months later, it took 14 months, uh, 14 months, but I won a 21 million pound contract off it. Yeah. Now, I had to put in that bit of legwork, the storytelling, the, you know, fancy bumping into you here. I just had a meeting around the corner. I just popped in for a beer on my way home. And to create that that bit of, you know, that gift of the gab seems to be missing a bit these yeah. days. Yeah. Well, you're lucky it d- didn't turn out that he'd given up drinking and you just became a regular at the pub and never got any business out of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and the story is eight weeks later, I was in rehab. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But listen, but that's such a fantastic story because, I mean, like you said, how long it took. And and I think that's another another piece here is that, you know, we live in what I call the shortcut culture now where everything is, there's a shortcut for everything. We're bombarded, but everything is easy and instantaneous and all of this. But the reality is like good things take time and that patience element, I think if you also have, you know, if you're also playing the long game, um, you also have an advantage over other people who, because everybody's playing the short game and the short game ain't working. They are. And uh, but one thing I should say is, you know, typical dyslexic thinking traits are that dyslexic thinkers are quite bad at that. They're always in a rush. You know, Mm. their mind is quite busy. Uh, So it's something it's maybe one of the more negative things around dyslexic thinking. And as I said, 
uh, earlier on, you know, it's really important that you don't just change the narrative of dyslexia being a disability to mm -hmm. being a superpower. Without a doubt, dyslexia has many positive traits for most people, but it's also an Achilles heel for many. I mean, the US prison statistics are that 50% of all prisoners are dyslexic too. Mm -hmm. So it really is an important uh, it's an important subject to focus on. On well, how do you how do you get more dyslexic people into entrepreneurship and self made millionaires than than the the US or the UK prison system? And I'm a strong believer that in changing the narrative and stop beating people up and seeing this as a negative, there's no way that they've got a disability with something we created ourselves. It's just rubbish to even think that reading and writing is an innovation created by us for us. And we simply created it, created it wrong. And what we've tried to do in the book, John, and I think we've done really well, is from each person that we've interviewed's life story, and we had unlimited access, and the people that we interview had no editing rights. And we interviewed mm. people from the UK's Dragon's Den, which is the US equivalent yeah. of Shark Tank, so US billionaires, UK billionaires, is we've taken a snippet of their life story and said, and this is the typical dyslexic thinking traits that went with their success. And this is how you might want to implement them in your life too. So this book isn't just for those with dyslexia. In fact, it's more important for those without dyslexia you know. that may want to implement dyslexic thinking traits themselves. Yeah, and I think that's a, and I think that's a really important clarification at the end there is that it's not just for it's not just for dyslexic people; it's for other people too can learn from it and maybe understand dyslexia obviously a lot more and uh, and and as you said, like t start taking the stigma away from it. And my goodness, you they need to they need to get your book into all the prisons here. I would say you know and, yeah and bring bring some bring some solace to those poor folks you know who've been struggling all their lives. Yeah, it's it's really hard. Eh? And I do some work you mentioned at the beginning with the Prince's Trust here in the UK, mm -hmm. where we set up a department that goes into prisons because, you know, typically the the, the percentage of reoffenders is just so high. Mm -hmm. Now you come out of prison, it's not very easy to go and get a job having been a prisoner. But you know what it's really easy to do? It's really easy to set up your own business, John. So yeah. we go into the prisons and we start to educate them on what they might want to do when they come out, including setting up their own market store, their own marketplace. Their, their little shop or whatever it's so easy today to do that yeah and if and and we don't i would like to grab every dyslexic thinker before they go to prison but if we have to grab them when they're in prison to ensure that they don't go back mm -hmm. then that's a success too yeah no absolutely fantastic well listen this has been this has been great jamie all of jamie's in, uh, information will be below this video including links to the books uh but before we go jamie please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do today so I am a serial entrepreneur. So I started my first business age 16 and my first significant business age 24. And since age 24, I've set up, built and sold four. And I now have 13 businesses across the UK, US, Australia and a variety of fields from data science and tech right through to men's clothing. So I'm what's considered as a startup guy. I like building businesses to be a value of between 60 and 80 million dollars and then i'm done i get very bored my adhd on top of my dyslexia means i want to move on to the next one but i love everything i do i'm i'm an entrepreneur through and through absolutely well it's a fantastic jamie and i would encourage you out there if you know i mean for your own education too but if you know anybody who has dyslexia or families or whatever like please please send them on the book and send them uh, you know all the links to jamie so thanks again jamie thank you for watching and listening See you all again very soon. Thank you.